We, we host um, many, many authors at the store. Um, most are professional writers. Uh, some come from other walks of life, journalism, uh, academia, politics. Uh, rarely, though, do we have the privilege of presenting a bona fide entrepreneur, as we do this evening. Uh, plus, he's a, he's a local guy, one who has done very well, not only for himself, but for Bethesda and the greater Washington area. Seth Goldman had one simple but rather big ambition when he started working. He wanted to do something that had an impact on the world. First, he tried the nonprofit and government sectors, but as he writes at the start of his new book, Mission in a Bottle, uh, he came to realize that business can be even uh, a more powerful tool for change. The result was Honest Tea, a company that Seth founded 15 years ago with Barry Nailbuff, a Yale uh, School of Management professor. They filled a void, developing a bottled, freshly brewed, a lightly sweetened tea drink. And today, Honest Tea is a still expanding national brand, sold in more than 100,000 grocery stores, restaurants, convenience outlets, and drugstores across the country. Perhaps most significantly, the company, even with its impressive growth, has remained true to its founding pr principles of authenticity and social responsibility. Now, uh, Mission in a Bottle is not your typical how I built my business tale. For one thing, it's presented in graphic format, uh, which reflects Seth's own attraction to comic books. Uh, the illustrations really help to add personality to the story and to explain some uh, sometimes complex issues, uh, like how to attract equity investors without giving away your company as it grows, or why a few cents worth of tea ends up selling for a buck 39 uh, a bottle. Um, and just to make sure the lessons don't get lost in the drawings, Seth and Barry conclude each section with thoughtful summations on issues ranging from uh, getting started to cashing out. This book also is uh, more frank and self-critical than a lot of business memoirs. As a review in the Financial Times said, the book feels like honest tea's products, a little sweetened and, well, honest. Uh, if there's a common thread among many of the reader comments so far, it's that this is a must read for those interested in starting businesses or those wanting to be socially conscious entrepreneurs. Uh, the Coca-Cola Company, as many of you know, acquired 40% of Honest Tea uh, about five years ago and took full ownership in 2011. But Seth has, has stayed on as chief executive an experience that might make for a very interesting second volume someday. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Seth Goldman. Thanks very much. Uh, this is really fun. I've been looking forward to this for a long time because this is a local institution and we certainly, as Brad said, really value our local connection. And you'll hear this is a very much a local story. So um, given it's a Tuesday night, we've all sort of come from work, I thought it'd be fun to um, <clears throat> tell our, share some of the parts of the book um, in a typically uh, politics and prose way, by which I mean that I will share with you um, 10 different themes from the book, and they all just happen to start with the letter P. So <laughs> the first one is pictures. Why would we do a picture book? Um, well, I was in my, when in uh, this, the idea for this book came in 2011. My oldest son was uh, in his senior year, and he had just entered, officially entered senior slump. And I was trying to read green business books. I felt like we had a story we wanted to share. And I just found the, the business books really boring. They were uh, repetitive. They got preachy. And at the same time, our oldest son, Jonah, who's dyslexic, had a, a, just a wonderful um, comic book series he kept bringing home. And I was trying to be the stern father saying, Jonah, you really, you really should be reading your school books, but let me see that comic book. <laughs> 
<laughs> if the comic book can be so uh, engaging, why can't a business book be engaging? And why can't we tell a story that um, certainly is relevant for an entrepreneur, but also could get a high school teenager, perhaps in his senior slum, interested in, in the bigger um, ideas out there? So, so pictures was really for us a great, and of course, Barry, um, you know, uh, as, as you'll hear, Barry is quite an unconventional thinker. And so he, just like the world doesn't need another bottled tea, the world doesn't need another business book. And it only was going to make sense if it was meaningfully different and, in our opinion, better. And so that was a way to tell a story in a different way. So uh, the number two uh, P is partner. And Barry was my professor. And uh, we collect, uh, we were, I was in his classroom talking about the beverage industry and talking about the fact that there's so many beverages on the shelves, and, and he asked the question, is there anything missing? And you know, you walk up the aisles and they're full. The world, as I said, doesn't need another beverage, except that almost all the beverages, when you look at it, are really the same. They almost all have the same ingredients. They almost all have the same calorie profile. This is back in 1997, 95. Um, and, they, uh, and so for us, there wasn't a drink like Honest Tea. There wasn't a drink that had 15, 20, 30 calories per serving. So there was that idea that we could be different. And um, so Barry and I, from two very different um, outlooks on the world, came together as partners. He being very creative, um, strategic thinker, not necessarily a people person, me being a little more of a people person and someone who's um, you know, able to execute ideas. The third P is possibility. So the idea that there was <laughs> something out there, um, as Barry says, you know, when you see a hole in the market, it's either a black hole, there's a reason someone hasn't gone there because there's no, no, one, no one comes back alive, <laughs> or it's a hole that just hadn't been discovered. And so obviously we were thirsty, we felt like that was a drink that um, other people hadn't created. And so we were willing to take the risk. So then we get into some of the more challenging P's. The first one is persistence, and you'll hear uh, in here the, how local this story is. So we knew we had to get in with beverage distributors. Those are the kind of distributors that build beverage brands. You know, this product is, is um, heavy. Uh, in the beginning, it was all made in glass, so we were not going to be shipping it through the internet or through, I'm sorry, through UPS, and we certainly weren't going to be <laughs> shipping it through ether, ether cables. Um, so we had to get it to stores, and not just to stores, we had to get it to shelves. And what, is, what we found very quickly is that the folks who, to really build a beverage brand, you needed to be with beverage distributors, whether it was the folks distributing Nantucket Nectars or Snapple or Arizona. And so we went to all of the beverage distributors, and they, they were very, uh, well, when they returned our calls, <laughs> they were friendly, but they were also very clear that this was not a product that was going to make sense. They said, you know, it's, it's not sweet enough, it's too expensive. It tastes a bit like grass. Um, it's just not, it's not what the market is, not what people are buying. And frankly, it wasn't what they were buying because they were, they had a sweeter tooth. Um, and so we had to find other ways to get to the shelf. And uh, so the first account we sold was um, uh, Bradley Food and Beverage, the uh, gourmet shop in, in Marvelous Market accounts like that. And we got to them through a cheese distributor. Uh, it's called Gormico, and it is funny. It just as it turns out, all the distributors we worked with was with C's. Not that I think always in letter series, but the cheese distributors were the first <laughs> to market. So then I went to Bethesda Bagels, which is you know if you want to be a beverage company in Bethesda, you better be in Bethesda Bagels. And I went there and I talked to Steve and, and said we want you to carry our product. He says, well, um, that'd be great. We'll carry it, but. Who do you work with? Well, we don't work with that cheese distributor. Why don't you talk to my corned beef distributor? So sure enough, we got in with a <laughs> corned beef distributor who um, got the product to, to Bethesda Bagels and to some other delis. And then we went down the road to Chevy Chase Supermarket. And he didn't work with the cheese distributor. He didn't work with the charcoal. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the corned beef distributor. He worked with the charcoal distributor. And that was how we got to the supermarkets. And eventually, through our perseverance, we started taking up shelf space that um, the beverage distributors wanted. And they said, well, if, if he's going to take our shelf space, then we may as well carry his product. And so that was how we sort of got up and running. The other part of Honest Tea, though, that is, you'll is see in the book is the personal. Um, that no matter how much you design a business, how much plans you make to uh, do things on your own, uh, life, I don't say life gets in the way, life happens. And so one of the um, for me, still intense periods uh, in the book and in, in my life was the day that um, Barry and I were in my kitchen making tea samples to bring to Whole Foods. Uh, my wife, Julie, walks in with our four-year-old son, and um, they'd just been for Ellie's annual checkup and realized that he had uh, a coarctation of the aorta. His aorta was closed off and was going to need major cardiac surgery. 
Um, so, so on the one hand, you know, here I am getting ready for the biggest appointment of certainly Honest T's brief career, and you know, certainly at a, a very uh, big moment for our family. And the fact was that throughout the book and throughout life, you know, you 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 know, uh, life happens just as business happens. And and so, um, you, as you'll see, this, this the the story of um, our family and the business are certainly intertwined, still are intertwined, and very much part of, um, you know, what we how we've had to build things. And not surprisingly, the next P uh, is pressure. <laughs> and so that's certainly um, something that, that was very much part of, of the building of the company. And I remember the first, um, the first month. So we, we made, uh, so Barry and I, just to, to, to tell you, we, made the, we did make the samples of tea. We put them in five thermoses with an empty Snapple bottle. And we brought them to the local, uh, with, with a label pasted on it. And we brought it to the local Whole Foods office and presented it to the buyer. And we got a green light, and the, and the buyer said, we'll take 15,000 bottles, which led to an awkward silence because, of course, we never <laughs> made anything except for in our kitchen. Um, <laughs> but, but I said, great, give me till June, and we delivered the product right on Memorial Day weekend. Um, so, but, that, but then after the next, uh, the 4th of July weekend, I uh, was at a family picnic eating a, um, a pizza, and I felt something crunchy in my mouth, and I said, there shouldn't be something crunchy in a pizza. And I um, realized it was my tooth had cracked. So I went to the dentist and I said, you know, I think, uh, you know, she says, yeah, you're, you know, it looks like you're grinding your teeth. Uh, are, you, are you under any stress? <laughs> I said, yeah, I guess you could say that. She said, well, I got two options for you. You can, you know, I, we can think about sort of some deep breathing exercises and yoga to help you relax, or I can get you fitted for a night guard. That way you, I said, tell me about the night guard, because <laughs> I don't see any, any let up to the pressure. Uh, so uh, that was certainly a recurring theme uh, for the book and for the story. Um, the, the next P is perseverance. So uh, we were succeeding in natural foods channels, but we were, we were struggling beyond natural foods. And we had a product that, that you know, was different and meaningful to a certain group of consumers who really liked it. But to get beyond that, uh, we needed to find other ways. And so we started to innovate. And perhaps our um, best innovation at early innovation was a product called Peach Ula Long. It was another P, but this was, uh, it was the first fair trade bottled tea. And it was 30 calories instead of 17 calories. And so uh, for us, we had a great deal of angst. Well, we started with a less sweet tea. You know, everyone else is at 100 calories, and we're worrying about should we go from 17 to 30? Um, and it was at the time a big psychological lift, but for um, adjustment. But in the marketplace, it just totally connected, and we started to see mainstream uh, consumers and, and mainstream accounts start to buy the product. Um, and so for us, the the evolution really helped. Um, then there's another P that is uh, it, it it just to to illustrate how um, how random uh, business can be. It's I'm going to use the P of potency, and um, there's a, there's a few folks who make guest appearances, cameo appearances in the book. One is um, President Obama. One is Oprah. Um, those are all, I say, on sort of fun occasions. The one that I wouldn't have wanted to have make a guest appearance is Howard Stern. And it's related to the potency, uh, a drink called Potency Punch. Now, fortunately, this was not a product that Honest Tea uh, marketed. But we owned a bottling plant for six years. And we made a product uh, by a company named Aura. And they had a drink called Potency Punch. And... Uh, the bottling plant was a source of many headaches, but none so, so bad as this one. So um, a customer in Denver went to a 7-Eleven, and he bought a bottle of Potency Punch and uh, went to the police station and said, there's a male organ in my bottle. Um, and, uh, you know, when I got the call from um, the, the general manager of the plant, he said, you know, I hope you're sitting down for this one. Uh, I said, why? Well... Some guy went in and said he found a male surprise in his bottle, and uh, <laughs> that's just what that is wrong on so many levels. Uh, <laughs> it's it's called mission in a bottle, not something else in a bottle, even though it starts with P. And uh, so so I called the um, one of the other owners of the plant, and I said, I hope you're sitting down for this. And I explained to her what happened, and she just sort of sat there with the phone in her hand. And, and at the time, there was a workman working on her computer. And he said, is everything OK, lady? And he says, well, you'll never believe this. We, we own this bottling plant. And, and somebody went to the store. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, they found a, 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 you know, a, a, male, a male surprise in the bottle. 
And uh, she said, how did you know that? She said, oh, I heard on Howard Stern this morning. So, <laughs> so um, you know, I guess the, the good news there was, first of all, it wasn't, uh, it was mold it, that looked like um, something else. Uh, that's the first, that was one piece of good news. The second piece of news is was not an honest tea product. Um, but <laughs> that potency punch uh, was no longer on the market after that. And it, just to illustrate how things happen that you could obviously never plan for. And someone, and uh, they were, someone who, a friend of mine who read the book said, that didn't really happen. I said, you know, you can't make that up. Um, <laughs> um, so that leads to, you know, with all, the, what's interesting, I, I've been talking a lot about the book these days, and someone said, you know, you and Barry had, had education, you know, Harvard, Yale, Barry's a Rhodes Scholar, you had access to capital, you had um, all this insight. I can't believe how close to going out of business the company was for all for ten years, um, and it's true. I mean, it's it's <laughs> there's no sugar coating it. We were te teetering on the brink a long time, and obviously, as you know, most um, most startups and certainly most beverage companies do not succeed. So, what carried us through, uh, and that leads to the ninth P, which certainly was for me has been passion. You know, this this has always been uh, much more than just about moving around uh, packages of of liquid. This is about the idea that we can take society in a different direction. And so one of the, um, one of the uh, we have a lot of bottle cap quotes. We have them in the book. We have them, um, in, for those of the benefit here, and, and inside the label, we put it, uh, you know, our quotes on the inside here with the plastic bottle. So we're always trying to share outlooks and, and views of the world. And there's a few that I want to share with you that certainly resonate with me. Um, the first is a Chinese proverb that says, if we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. And so where are we going? Well, um, the, to me, the most haunting indication of where we're going is when you look at average life expectancy. So we're the wealthiest, the United States is the wealthiest nation in the, in the history of the world. We have more advanced knowledge of science and medicine than any civilization has ever had. We spend more per capita on healthcare than any uh, other nation. But when it comes to ranking average life expectancy, we're not number one, we're not number two, we're number 40. So what does that say about our, our diets, about our lifestyles, about the way we interact with each other, with, with nature, um, the, way, the inequities in our, in our population? And so for me, this, this uh, business is really a start at trying to take things in a different direction. And obviously, it needs to happen. It's a, this, is a, this is a very complex issue. It didn't happen overnight. It's not going to be changed overnight. Um, and it has to happen on multiple fronts. Um, so, but diet is clearly an opportunity to do that. Uh, it's another reason, actually, tonight's author proceeds are going to benefit Urban Alliance, which is a wonderful organization that helps um, D.C. area high school students get on the path to college uh, and work in, in professional intern internships. Um, but for me, the, the idea that the, what mission in a bottle really means is that we're not a, we've never wanted to be a company that made profit. <laughs> It's not that we never want to be profitable. Someday we had the ask. We were for the first ten years. We were a nonprofit, uh, not, not by design. But um, the goal wasn't to make money and give it away. The goal was to make sure every time we sold a product, we were doing something positive. And so, when it could be lower calorie, when we could make sure make the ingredients organic, when we could make the ingredients fair trade, there was the opportunity to do that. And so, um, then it comes to the question of uh, probability. And I'm going to share an excerpt of the book with you in a, in a second. But the probability is, what are the chances of this working? Well, Barry and I, uh, so, so uh, Barry and I have had some very, my, you know, uh, we, we, we have to have disagreements. That's, it, in order to work, you have to have, you know, some friction. So one of the disagreements we have in the book is around probability. So Barry starts lessons learned at the end. He says, we were thirsty, and we were also very lucky. And then I go on, um, when I, so Barry and I have a dialogue in the book, and, and this is a, a little excerpt from toward the end of the book. And so I say, so were we lucky? This won't be the first time I'm going to disagree with Barry. We were thirsty, we were lucky enough, and we worked our tails off. But I reject the notion that we were lucky to be in the right place at the right time. It took us 10 years of hard work to end up in the right place at the right time. 10 years in which several competitors with better access to resources arose and crashed. This was not an overnight success story. One of my favorite bottle cap quotes comes from UCLA basketball coach John Wooden. Things turn out best for people who make the best of the way things turn out. While we had our share of near-death experiences, we bounced back because we had enough of the three Ps of entrepreneurship, passion, persistence, and perseverance. 
And so ultimately, um, what uh, for me, Honest T's story is, is really about a story about potential. You know, it's, <laughs> we've been at it 15 years, so it's hard to imagine. It feels, you can to say we're just getting started. But when we look at the changes that we can make happen, um, this is a start. You know, corporate America is not going to create companies like Honest T on their own. It takes entrepreneurs to, to, to bring concepts that challenge the market. And only when they work, and, and you know, fortunately ours did, will a large company buy in and you know, sort of bring that brand in and make it part of their offerings. And to give you a sense of what's happened since we sold to Coca-Cola, uh, when Coke invested in 2008, Honest Tea was in about 15,000 stores. Today, as you heard, we're in over 100,000 stores, and we're starting to have conversations with national, um, certainly national um, grocery chains, but also national restaurant chains. Um, so to think about, we talk about democratizing organics and getting organic and fair trade products into the hands, not just of the, the coasts or, or the Whole Foods crowd, but to people every day. Um, and then we look at the impact of our purchasing. So when Coke invested in 2008, we were buying about 800,000 pounds of organic ingredients. This year, we'll buy over 5 million pounds. And when we can build that kind of demand in, in, in India and China and, and South Africa, we can help transform what goes on in the agricultural practices. And when it can be fair trade tea, we can transform the opportunity that these um, communities face. Um, so it can be a very powerful um, thing. It's, it has been a, um, for me, the chance to share the story and hopefully to inspire others to follow not necessarily an, an organic beverage company. I hope that this is, that's not the upshot as we had a whole bunch of other bottled tea competitors, but I hope uh, people who, 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 who seek out, um, you know, find a passion that they that really um, care about. And, and I'll just close with, uh, before we open up for questions, um, just a, a closing thought. So was honest tea in the right place at the right time? I've come to realize that even if you are building something you believe in, you still may not win. But if it is something worth fighting for, Win or lose, you are in the right place at the right time. So thank you very much. And um, happy to take questions, um, comments. So where do you go from here? Yeah. Further so, in the beverages or in another direction? So, it, it's, so the wonderful thing, uh, when we started the company, we thought Honest Tea, we thought the most important part of the name was tea. So we had tea bags, which, as you'll read, was not a successful uh, experience. Uh, and then we realized the most important name part of the word was honest. So we expanded to honest aid, which are the juice drinks. And then we went from there to honest kids, which is um, actually an exploding part of our line. It's, it's grown very quickly. We have now a line called Honest Fizz, which is a zero calorie, naturally sweetened soda line. But we're also um, in investigation um, preparation to, to think about how do we, what do we do with honest food. We have the rights to honest food and to honest snacks. And so to make something honest would be you know, less sugar, organic ingredients, healthier than what else is out there. Think about honest clothes. Honest clothes. <laughs> yes, thank you for your talk, and thank you for making this product. Uh, my favorite tea is the Assam Black. I like the Peach Oolong and the Lori's Lemon Tea also. I had a question concerning the transition. Uh, when people heard about the Coca-Cola investment, obviously people were rather concerned. Sure. Uh, some people are old enough to remember what happened to Snapple mm -hmm. and what happened to Soho Sodas, et cetera. Yeah. What was the process by which you ended up where you are with your product in 100,000 stores? That's a good question because, um, you know, one thing that happened when we, just when we started building the business in 2000, Coca-Cola bought a uh, bottled tea company. Does anyone happen to know the name of it? Mad River. And the reason not many people knew the name is because, like some of these other brands you mentioned, it didn't succeed. So for us, we were very mindful, and Coke was mindful. Look, we're not gonna, they don't want to spend the money. We certainly didn't want to give over our, our, you know, what we created and then see it disappear. And so the fact that uh, when Coke invested, it was a minority investor. For, it owned 40, they bought 40% of the company. That meant I, we in in this case, me, was, was still in control of the company. And so for those three years, we demonstrated our ability to, to grow the brand in a way that was meaningful for them, but um, not sacrifice what we built. And frankly, uh, after they bought the company, we said, this is still working. Let's keep going. There was no requirement on either side. I mean, I wasn't, I, I wasn't required to stay with the company, and I didn't somehow create a condition that they had to keep me. But it's, it's, it's been... Um, 
a good beneficial partnership. So, you know, I, my goal is to bring this to scale um, to, you know, larger than it is with these values embedded in it. And then ideally they, they should last if, if, if that's where the equity is. And just to give you a sense of scale. So this year we'll do over $100 million in sales. Um, we are, which will be about, it's about $180 million in retail sales. And, and Coke's goal, our shared goal is to build this to a billion dollar brand. Hmm. Uh, so we, we still have a ways to go. Thank you. I was wondering uh, how similar you were to Ben and Jerry's, which was bought up by Unilever. Right. Um, if you used alternative business practices, like uh, they had a certain scale, no no manager made more than like 10 times yeah. more than an employee. Yeah. I mean, do you use a capitalist model of maximizing profit? Do you do things that cost you more money because you don't want to yeah. hurt the environment? Yeah. C can you make it in a... a competitive market yeah if you have a social conscience sure well it's it's a good question and and uh, ben and jerry's definitely has been an inspiration and, and ben cohen is is someone i'm friendly with um i think one important difference uh is that with ben and jerry's the product they sell um though it's tasty is is not really benefiting the health of the consumer they'll say they sell <laughs> yogurt i've heard him ask that they do but it's and low fat it's still well yeah. low fat for High fat yogurt. <laughs> so, no, I, 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 that's, I don't want to take any, uh, I don't want to in any way belittle Ben and Jerry's. It's an, it's an inspiring model, as I said, inspired me. But, um, you know, for us, it's been always been important that the product we're selling on its own is, has a sort of a benefit to it. Um, and Ben and Jerry's has actually moved now toward fair trade, you know, on both some of their, their sweeteners and some of their, you know, chocolate and, and vanilla. Um, for us, um, we definitely are, we have to be uh, a financially, uh, driven company. We went to, not just for Coca-Cola, we went to have survived as a business if we weren't able to be able to, to, to deliver results to our shareholders. And by the way, the founding investors from Honest Tea made 26 times their investment. So we did deliver on that return. Um, but continuing, we need to do that. And, and yet, we still have found ways for us. What we've done, um, certainly the biggest thing we've done was uh, for the first 10 years, every employee had stock in the company. Um, so that, that is that idea of everyone's in this together and can benefit. We've also done things like we bought bicycles for every employee uh, back in, I think, 2006. We we're doing a national bike promotion. Um, and and um, so we, di we didn't have, uh, we, we, di we did meet that, that, certainly that multiple lines of salary, but it wasn't an official policy. Um, and so uh, for us, there's no question our employee uh, benefits and practices are different, um, but we also do things that, you know, some companies may not admire we, we we share hotel rooms when we're traveling um, <laughs> and that's not for everybody but i'll tell you it's a very effective way to screen out certain employees too <laughs> it's a certain it's a certain kind of employee so actually honest t's 15th anniversary is coming up this year and this will be the first year we're we're, we're on track to hit our our financial goals this will be the first everyone's sort of excited about it the first company meeting where we don't have to share, share hotel rooms so uh <laughs> i don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing but um and if you go to our offices in bethesda you'll see that we still are using uh somebody called it reclaimed reclaimed furniture but it's basically just you know recycled furniture it's all thank you here um hi seth i wanted to hear a little more about Barry and your relationship there and, you know, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, was he involved because you're yeah. down here and he's up there? Yeah. Uh, did you think about getting divorced many times in the no. process? And yeah. How did that, a little yeah. more about that it, good stuff? It's a, it, yeah, it, it was a very unusual partnership. So, first of all, um, Barry uh, did keep his day job. He is still a professor at Yale. Uh, he was chairman of the board, um, but especially during the early years, it's, it is a, it's lonely to be a CEO. Um, it really is. You, there's questions or decisions you have to face that um, you can't talk to other people about. And, and in one of the more, once again, sort of absurd situations we find ourselves in, we had an employee who had a, um, his wife had an affair and got pregnant with a family friend and he wasn't performing. And so how do you deal with that? Um, and so, you know, having someone to talk to about that was really important. Um, Bear, before I launched the company, I was working at Calvert Funds up the road, and I went up to New Haven, and I sat across from Barry's, uh, Barry at his kitchen table, and we just talked it out. I, we didn't obviously foresee this situation, but I said, what do, what do, I want to understand totally what, what, what you're in this for, what you hope to see happen, and here's what I hope to see happen. Here's my, not that I had a full life plan, but we, it was full disclosure. We held nothing back. And um, there was also, there were times, there was, there was one time in the book where we had an, um, an offer from not Coca-Cola, but a very large multinational. 
and um, Barry basically insult. It was perceived as an insult to the to the the guy in charge, and the guy said, "Barry has screwed up your future. You're you know you're you're um, you're going to regret this." And and I I had I I stuck by Barry because we'd gotten this far together. We were going to get. Um, and, and so, actually, of, of course, after we sold the company, there was nothing binding us to work together. And that was, for me, the chance to re-collaborate with Barry was one of the great benefits of, of writing the book. Um, so, as different as we are, and my classmates from Yale were always like, I can't believe it. Because Barry had the reputation of being a bit of a cold-calling, kind of heartless uh, professor, and I, that's not my style. Um, but it's been a wonderful collaboration. And I think he would say he's mellowed a bit since uh, we've been working together. Thank you, Seth, for a um, very informative discussion. I have two-part question. The first is, when are you going to go to gallon size product? <laughs> yeah. So we really love it, and yeah. we need, but we need the volume of it, yes. right? As opposed to little sampling. Right. And the second one is that uh, I think the the Washington Post had an article about you concerning your Bethesda Green Incubator. Yes, yeah. I did. Could you explain a little sure. bit for people? Sure. Happy that? to. Sure. So first of all, we are in 59 ounce bottles, but we've just started that, so we're <laughs> we're getting there. And, and you know, let me just say, obviously. With a company that that's, thinks about its sustainability, the fact that we sell these days over 100 million individual units, um, that's something we're, we have to think about, right? We're, we're committed to sustainability, but we have single-serve packages, and we know national recycling rates are around 30%. So I'd like to think our consumers are better at recycling than most, but you know, if, if, two -thirds of the, if, if we're responsible for 60 million packages not going into a recycling stream, then that's an issue we have to deal with. And, and we are trying to both increase recycling rates and then think about our own package sustainability. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, Bethesda Green. Green, yeah, thank you. So, Bethesda, so um, in 2007, as we, the company was sort of getting, like, we felt like we were going to be here for more than at least another few months, um, we said, well, we'd been supporting sustainability around, you know, the world through our partnerships with our communities, but we need to do something in Bethesda. And when Coke said, uh, and I said, you know, I, I'm really committed to, to maintaining the business in Bethesda, what can we do to send a signal? Um, and, and one of the things that's always struck me in Bethesda is, Despite the fact we have great residential recycling, curbside recycling, no, there was no recycling in the streets of Bethesda, you know, on the walkways. And so I got Coke to give uh, $35,000 to help really get Bethesda Green off the ground. And the first thing we did was put recycling bins throughout downtown Bethesda. Um, the Bethesda Urban Partnership had the, the truck bays. They had the capacity to pick up the bottles. They just didn't have the bins. And from there, um, you, you know, the bins have sort of mushroomed out. Um, and then, uh, as Bethesda Green was growing, we're thinking about what else we could do. I had gone to Calvert, my old employer, to get them to, to, to be invested in federal realty. And I went to, at the time, Chevy Chase Bank. I said, love to get your guys' support. And I didn't know at the time they were being bought by Capital One. They said, well, we can't write you a check, uh, but we do have some office space above uh, one of the branches. Could you use that? And uh, I, I knew the space because Honesty had actually looked at it for office space ourselves. I said, not only can we use it, but would you be open to us making it an incubator? and we could bring in other green entrepreneurs and let them launch businesses out of there. So today there's over 16 different green entrepreneurs, one of whom is in the audience today, wave hello, <laughs> um, launching green businesses out of there. And it's just wonderful to see, uh, and I, I, I don't want to overstate, you know, I'm, I'm, I, so I was a co-founder of Bethesda Green, and I'm on the board now, and I'm wonderful, hap, happy to support it. Um, but this has its own life, and it's really exciting to see it, it grow and flourish. Yeah, hi Seth. Uh, I read the Kindle version of the book this weekend, and I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I, I noticed on uh, day two you uh, deleted solitaire <laughs> off your computer, and, and on day three you wrote your business plan. Those seem a little unequal. As yeah. far as no, I think the, I, uh, the deleting solitaire was probably the single most important keystroke we made. <laughs> so, so my my question is, you don't say a lot about what you did with your business plan. I think it yeah. comes up a couple times. Uh, in terms of uh, who you shared that with yeah. and, and uh, how you use that. Yeah. yeah. So by the way, the our business plan, the one we wrote, is on the Honesty website. And you can see it there. Uh, and it was something that we shared with investors uh, because uh, it, it, to the extent, when you start a company and all you have is, is an idea that, like I said, at the time we were raising money from investors, we didn't have anything. We didn't have any bottles. <laughs> we didn't have any labels. Uh, we just had this idea. So we had the business plan. And that was what we presented to investors as the basis for the business. What's funny about it, as I look back on that business plan now, is um, 
it, it does do a really good job of describing the, the aspirations for the brand. We wanted to create a brand that stood for, you know, connected to social responsibility for health and, and for sustainability. It has no discussion of distribution and no discussion of production. As it turns out, those were pretty important uh, <laughs> to, to the business. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another question. So had you put much thought into how you were going to scale the production? Because it, it seemed like that just snuck yeah. up on you somehow, and, and that does seem it, a little There are some very funny scenes in the beginning where we um, – so we called it honest tea because it was about using real tea leaves. And what many of you may not realize is most bottled tea isn't made with real tea leaves. It's used with a powder or a syrup. They add water and stir, and they call that tea. So we said, well, we're going to use real tea leaves. And we, why doesn't anyone else use real tea leaves? We found out very quickly. <laughs> so we used these big mesh bags, and we were trying to dunk them in the water. And then the bags would break, and the pipes would clog. They'd, we, one of, my, one of the people who helped me get it started was a, a guy named George, the brewmaster, who lived in our basement. And um, he had terrible puns. And, and we were trying to make a chai. And the, ch the chai, during one of the explosions where we were literally wearing chai, he says, this is a very chaiing experience. <laughs> <laughs> so we had more than a few. And in the beginning, those of you who may remember, we had you know, sort of an inch and a half of tea leaves on the, the bottom of the bottle. And somebody, someone said, am I supposed to chew that? <laughs> Um, so it evolved over time. Your, hey, Bruce. your story that I love the most is where you explain that the the problem actually was the solution. Will you sure. share that story? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So um, this was a really interesting for me, illuminating um, visit to a tea garden. I, it was in Anhui Province in South Central China, and I had flown a long way and driven a long way, and and. Uh, and by the time I got out of the car, I'm like, okay, where are these tea bushes? Because I've come this far. Let's get to the tea bushes. And I got out, and I didn't see any tea bushes. I was in a village, and my host led me down a path, and the path opened onto a river. And I still didn't see any tea bushes. I said, we are here to see tea bushes, right? Said, oh, yeah, no, it's just on the other side of the river. So my natural impulse was to look around for a bridge, because that's normally how you would get across a river. And I didn't see any bridge if you're in commerce. And I said, well, have you thought about building a bridge? I tried to say it politely, but I was probably a little impatient. They said, well, no, we haven't. And, and they gave me four reasons. So number one, this is a poor, we're poor. We don't have the ability to just build a bridge because that might you know, make long-term sense. Number two, there's a lot of flooding in this part of China. And, and at one season, the bridge may be underwater. Another one, it may be far from land. Number three, it's an organic tea garden. There wasn't be a need for... Uh, heavy equipment or large bags of chemicals. But the most interesting things that they said, and it's, it's stuck with me, is, is if we build a bridge, then there'll be a road. And if there's a road, there'll be infrastructure. And if there's infrastructure, there'll be pollution. So for this community, not having the bridge was the solution. Now, how, do you, how do you protect a source? Um, so I, what, I thought, what I thought was a, a problem was actually its own solution. And for me, actually, and I, I blow that... that um, incident up into other scenarios where we'll think about agriculture. Well, we see pests in a field or we see weeds in a field. Those are a problem. And the solution that we often bring are chemical pesticides, which have their own toxins. Uh, and sometimes they say, we create so many solutions, we're killing ourselves. My son, the one who inspired me to make the graphic novel, is dyslexic. And, and the fir, you know, the, his third, fourth, um, third, third and fourth grade experience was very challenging for all of us because he felt he was dumb, he couldn't read. We had academic uh, specialists telling us he needed to be on medication. And then when we realized he had dyslexia, it wasn't a problem, it was a gift. We just had to understand what to do with it. Um, so so often in, in life and, in, and certainly in business, um, what, we, what we perceive as a problem could be a solution. And in fact, for, co for, for Honest Tea, for Coca-Cola, you, know, you could look at the beverage industry and say, well, this is a a, a large multinational that's selling drinks that are very sugary, uh, with uh, using ingredients that aren't uh, that are relatively inexpensive, um, and that could be perceived as a problem. But for honest tea, selling an, or, an organic, low-calorie drink, um, we could actually fit together very well because we're bringing them something they don't have. So um, that whole outlook has really shaped my view, not just of business but of life. Now I know on the supply side, you're sourcing from overseas and things like that. But um, in part of your expansion, going from 100 million to a billion, are you looking at international markets? Are you there already yeah. with the brand and the taste yeah. that created work there as well? So, um, so we have, when we talk about getting to a billion, that's in the United States. 
Um, that said, we do want to expand internationally, and, and tea is the world's second most popular drink. So the, the, the first being water, by the way, not Coca-Cola. Uh, <laughs> so um, there's no question there's an international opportunity. Um, I think for us, though, the, it's kind of like we're at a buffet table. We need to make sure we can get this market built the right way. And we are starting to look at some international opportunities. And, you know, I don't know how the rest of the world will react. Um, my, my bottle tea is not as big in, in a lot of other markets. My, my thesis is because a lot of the um, bottle tea they sell is very sweet. And so I hope, I'd like to believe that th this less sweet drink, you know, may be an opportunity. I've spent a lot of time in Japan, and Coca-Cola yeah. has done pretty well with their teas and even their coffees in that market. Are they place. sweet in there? Are they very sweet? They or? are not as sweet. Not as sweet? Okay, are. so that's good. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your speech. Sure. Um, I'm currently applying to MBA programs, and similarly, I'm very interested in social entrepreneurship. Yes. Um, so harnessing the, the power of the for-profit sector for social good. So I'm interested in what advice you have for young professionals interested mm. in that field, and then how you were able to leverage your MBA experience. So aside from reading the book, which obviously, <laughs> so Barry joked, uh, I was with Barry over the weekend, and, and, and you may, I may sound like a salesperson, but Barry really loves to give a pitch. But uh, <laughs> he said, if, you know, if we had read this book before we launched our business, we would have saved at least a million dollars by not buying a bottling plant um, and <laughs> a lot of other of the other mistakes. I think um, I'm, I'm I've been on the board of a, a, a company, an organization called Net Impact, which is about MBA students pursuing um, mission-driven careers. And it is uh, every year I go to the Net Impact conference, and it is so inspiring. It's the thing, the single most hopeful event I go to every year because I see people really not just serious about changing the world, but getting the skills to do that. Um, and I've, I've, um, one of the things that inspired me to go to business school was I was part of the national service movement just when it was getting started. And I saw a lot of people with tremendous passion, but without the management skills to run, to, to, to scale the passion, to, to make it into something. So I do think an MBA can be a, an important part of that. I think um, the, the two things that are really helpful are to be actually try selling something. It's not as easy as it you know, people often say business schools, business skills are really important, but selling is a very important skill because you're not just selling um, product, you're selling ideas, you're selling investors, you're selling employees. Um, and then also trying, you know, reading business plans and, and just sort of getting a feel for it is, is a, a great discipline to sort of understand how a business gets put together. And I, I, one of the things that's been fun about this book is people, I've heard from teenagers who've read it, and now they get how business works. And it is a simple business. It is, you know, I, I realize if we were a tech company, we could have said, well, I went home and I wrote this logarithm. Or <laughs> it's not quite the same. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Sure. Sure. Um, I want to take advantage of um, the fact that now you've written a book. And so you've gotten an inside look at the book business. Yes. So can you apply some of your business acumen to this? This business yeah. and what advice have you got? Well, I've got to say, um, I am in extremely impressed. I'm not trying to just blow smoke here, but um, I'm really impressed at, at when I see what Politics and Prose does because it is more than just moving, like us, it's more than just moving product. It's about building community. It's about um, uh, really creating a, an experience for people. So if you, if you just were selling books to people and there was no connection, then people would do it online. So, so investing in what makes you different is extremely important. And, and it, it's clear as, as we've now started to sell these books around the country, um, I mean, the pricing is, you know, in a way you're the big, you know, if you think about um, big corporations, obviously a, a company like Amazon on pricing, it's just, I, I don't even know how they, how they do that. Um, but, you know, as you can see by the presence here, the, the fact that you've created something an experience that's meaningful that's something they can't do so I would invest in all the things that you can do that are that continue to make it a meaningful experience and I certainly appreciate obviously the ability to be here like this and and um, I will say that um, when we did our tour to publishers to, to, to pitch the book it was a um, you had a feeling like this was an industry that was didn't quite know what to do just like the newspaper industry obviously has had to go through its own kind of um, realization of, of, of a changing moment. Um, but I, I think it, it, what's interesting, I, I'm more, I'd be more worried if I were a, a Barnes & Noble with three stories of, you know, they're not selling anything in the basement anymore. The music industry's kind of evaporated and it's hard to pay that rent. So I think, I think you've actually got a more solid position and I would just be very careful about how you expand it and, and extend the brand. 
Um, maybe just a closing thought then. So one of the things we're also proud of is the fact that the bottom of our bottle says established 1998 Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and that, that's, the tr that's true whether this product is sold in Bethesda or sold in California. Um, but we've always you know, really um, been very proud of, of our connection to the community. And um, you know, I, I don't know if five years from now I'll be talking to you as, as someone leading on his tea, but um, certainly that, that the local origins, the, 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 the real story behind the product is something we've, we really wanted to share. And, and the goal is to really inspire um, not just people to launch enterprises, it's for people to pursue work that connects with their passions. And not just 50% not of their passions, their life's too short, work's too hard to do something you don't just believe in 100%, to really be able to give it your all. And it's, there's no question there are those white knuckle moments. Um, and and uh, I'm very glad to have my wife here who's <laughs> been on the ride with me all the, all the way. And, and uh, there were certain times when I'd come home and I'd take a deep breath and she'd say, what's the matter? I'd say, oh, she says, I don't want to know. <laughs> so, um, uh, but to be able to, to, to get to this point and to be able to share the story and the lessons has been, a, it's a really um, satisfying and exciting moment for us. And, and I hope you all find uh, whatever stage you are in life and career, uh, a mission that, that you can pour everything into as well. Thank you very much.